Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll um, just pray and get started. Um, I just wanted to um, just remind us about uh, the Lord's instruction in Matthew chapter 6. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Okay, so, you know, this is something that we do on a daily basis. You know, if, if you're not careful, we can slip into this. Which is? Matthew, Matthew 6, 25. Yeah. So this is something that we, um, you know, sometimes we slip into this and then we think, we say that, okay, it's normal. Like a lot of things are normalized in life. Right? Um, and just because we see everyone doing it, or you know, everyone says it's normal, doesn't make it normal, right? Very important. Um, especially some of the values that we see, and um, you know, um, so we we think, okay, it's normal. Why? Because that's the popular culture. No, that's that's what everyone indulges in. That's what everyone does. So I guess it's normal. If it's normal for others, it's normal for me as well, right? Um, so we we see here a very specific instruction, and it's we can say you know we can say it's a command, right? The Lord is saying you know therefore do not worry. That's how it starts, right? Verse twenty five, and um, so which means that he's everything that he shared before. Um, comes and bears on that word, therefore, right? Everything that he shared, uh, right from, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit and so on. So he's he's talking about everything. He's talking about, um, you know, his, his, uh, the, the Lord's prayer and, um, and where he's saying, um, you know, do not lay up treasures for yourself, uh, etc. And then no one can serve two masters, God and money and, and, the, and then he comes and says, therefore, do not worry. Okay. And uh, he's talking about very legitimate needs. Okay. Which means that these are needs and these are not luxuries or wants. Okay. He's talking about basic things. Food, clothing, shelter. Three very basic necessities in life. Three things. And then he says that, um, you know, these are all things... Your father knows, your heavenly father knows that you have need of these things. So he's saying, you know, he's saying, he's not saying don't work for it. He's, he's not saying don't plan about, plan, plan for it. Um, don't pray about it. But he says, don't worry about it. Right. So, and also other things, you know, we can say, okay, at least three things is very clear. Food, clothing, shelter, I should not worry about. Okay, but what about other things in life? You know, can I worry about it? Right? But the thing is, the Lord is saying, do not worry. Okay, and the reason is this, that He is the provider and He will make things um, happen. And uh, when we seek Him, His kingdom, His rule and reign in our lives, um, that all the other things will fall in place. Okay, and I just want to add, you know, He just said, He didn't say, you don't worry, you know, you don't work for it, right? Didn't say you don't work for it because one of the ways in which God provides for us is through work, right? Uh, he didn't say don't plan for it or don't dream, you know, big things. He never said that. He said don't worry because worry cannot help. Uh, he says, um, you know, uh, how can, uh, uh, you know, why do you worry about clothing? Why do you uh, worry about these things? Um, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Um, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So that's the assurance. My Heavenly Father knows that I have need of all these things, right? And He He will make sure that He'll provide and He'll give provide those avenues uh, through which these things can come into my life. But I'm going to seek Him, right? Okay, let's pray. Let's uh, let's pray and, um, and and just you know, if we have been worrying, we can just say, Lord, I I just want to let go of that okay so what is it that's worrying you today can you just place it bring it before god 
Maybe it's about your future. Maybe it's about your present. Maybe you're worrying about what happened in the past. You know, just bring it before the feet of Jesus. Bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, you said, do it, therefore do not worry. And therefore, I will not worry. You know, we can just make it a simple prayer. Therefore, Lord, I will not worry because you said it, Lord. And Father, we, we thank you because you are our Heavenly Father. We thank you that, um, Lord, that your, you know our needs even before we ask of them, Lord. And uh, Master, even as we, uh, Lord, you asked us to bring our needs to you, Lord, to ask and seek and to knock, God. And so we do that, Lord, and all, do all that without worrying, Lord. Yes, Master, Spirit of God, lead us, um, Lord, so that we don't fulfill the desires of the flesh, uh, and some of the desires could be to just worry and um, to be in that place of uh, not making any progress. But Lord, I pray today that um, you will release us from that. And uh, may we, Lord, move forward. Lord, let not worry cripple any of us, God, in that particular area, God. And not, let not worry paralyze any of us. Uh, we pray that there will be momentum, there will be movement, there will be breakthrough in those very things, God, even as we release these to you, cast these onto you, Lord, and cast these burdens onto you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Inner wholeness. How's your garden? Yeah. <laughs> the internal garden. Is it being nurtured? Is it full of weeds? Is it thriving, flourishing? Yeah. Okay, so we looked at uh, some of the lifestyles uh, of uh, that we need to put in place, lifestyle changes, right? And uh, we, the last one we looked at was practicing the power of forgiveness, okay? Uh, so chapter 7, we're looking at, you know, uh, another important aspect. We've, we've studied it before, the conquest of the mind. Okay, um, just want to encourage us, Conquest of the Mind, the publication, the book. Uh, maybe some of you have read it. And maybe, I think, um, maybe in your first years, you must have also written a review of it. Have you? Conquest of the Mind, no? Okay. So if you've never, never read it, I uh, just want to encourage you to uh, uh, get a hold of it, read it. Um, and it's a, it's a very good um, book on... On the mind, okay, the fact that uh, our mind is something that sometimes we we neglect what goes on in our mind. So, you know, things like worry, for example, and uh, and how our mind is, you know, that's the first thing that we're going to see that how our mind is a battlefield. Okay, uh, battlefield for what? Battlefield for who? Right? Battlefield where the enemy wants to really take a hold of and rain okay um, so you know we, we we can do one of the two things we can say okay you know all this talk about the evil spirits and powers of darkness yeah i know some extent but you know maybe you know sometimes we just you know we don't think about it right we don't factor that in but the fact is that our mind is a battlefield and it is for the enemy to work on. It is for our unrenewed flesh to be even enthroned, our, our unrenewed flesh to take hold of us. And, um, and But it is also something to be renewed. And a renewed mind is, is a, it's a powerhouse, right? A renewed mind is something that, uh, that would just you know, just grab a hold of whatever instructions that come from the Holy Spirit, whatever truth that is quickened by the Holy Spirit, a renewed mind is so, so powerful in the life of a believer, right? Just imagine just, um, you know, there is a suggestion from God, there is a whisper from the Holy Spirit, and your mind does not negate it, but just goes with it, right? Or uh, just grabs a hold of it. And uh, and and it's so wonderful, right? Okay. So so what is what is it that come, you know, uh, to our minds? Uh, we, we use our minds to pros uh, I mean, to process a lot of things, right? We analyze with our minds. We uh, there is sometimes even um, you know uh, our imaginations are in the in the realm of our you know, in our mind, right? Our soul. 
So uh, what happens is that whoever has our mind has us. Okay. So so that's the thing. You know, in in the sense, like for example, if you look at advertisement. Okay. So right now, you know, if if I'm thinking of clothing. You know, one thing comes to my mind that is the recent store that I went to, which is Zudio. Okay, I found that okay, things are not so expensive. There's a good range of clothes and uh, thing. So that is, you know, when I think of clothes, I'm thinking of Zudio. Okay, so that's been in our mind. When you think of cold drink, what do you think of? Limka, thumbs up. Anyone else? Fruit juice. This is no soft drinks. <laughs> okay, that's a healthier option. See, but the reason we think of Limka or Thumbs Up or Coke or no Fanta is is there's a reason. Okay, of course you've liked the product, you've enjoyed it, but also there's an advertising which reiterates and reaffirms that hey, you you know go for it. Whenever you think of a soft drink, whenever you think of you know you have you are thirsty. Go for it, right? It's summer. You need a cold drink. Go for it. So that's why it's in our minds, right? So uh, th that's why you know I said whoever has our mind has us. You know, therefore, we see that there is you know so much invested. Every company pumps in so much of money into advertising. So much in advertising, right? And wherever we turn, you know, it, it need not be just the billboards, but Whatever we see on social media, you know, the, on YouTube, there are some videos which come, advertisements which come, and uh, of course you have those two seconds of whatever, how many seconds to skip it, but those ads come. Why do people spend so much? You know, we think, you know, what is this? And some of these ads are not meant for you, right? Because that's why you find it boring. You're like, oh, this is, it's not for you. You know, it's for a different age group. It's for a different season of life, but. They want to put it there because they want to capture the mind space. So when you think of maybe housing, when you think of a vehicle, when you think of it, a holiday, when you think of clothes, whatever, you know, you're thinking of this thing. That's what, right? So a mind is a powerful thing, right? It's uh, this is what James says, you know. When it, uh, you know I, and when James, uh, you know, in James chapter one, he's talking about the whole breakdown of our thinking or breakdown of the process of temptation. Okay, so what does he say? He says that uh, James chapter one verse thirteen: Let no one say when he is tempted, "I'm tempted by God," for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Verse fourteen: But each one is tempted when he is drawn away, okay, led away. Okay, that's verse 14. Drawn away, we're on page 40 in the notes. Drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay, so there is this whole place of desires, our own thoughts, our own imagination, our own desires. And we are drawn away. Drawn away from what? Drawn away from maybe some decision that we Right, righteous thing that we decided. He said, okay, I'm going to live like this. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to, you know, delight God's heart. This is what I'm going to do. That's the thing that you've decided. That's the thing that you're focusing on. But one is tempted when one is drawn away from that. Right? What, is, what does it mean to draw, or draw away? When you're drawn away. To move away. Yeah. What, what, what do you say? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So draw, draw is more like, you know, you're you're pulled away, and it's it's. He says you're pulled away by your own desires. He says there are some some desires, and you're pulled away. Now these desires need not be bad desires, you know. It's just that these desires. The desire is to satisfy those desires in a way that is not appropriate or in a way that is not God ordained. Right? All these desires right, need not necessarily be wrong, 
but to satisfy those desires in not god ordained ways now that's wrong right okay so each one is drawn away pulled away by their own desires thoughts imaginations you know and enticed and that word used there you know uh, i think it's scandalon which means that in greek which means it's a trap it's a snare okay so entice which means you know it's like it literally means a snare that is used to catch an animal like how you can use a rat trap right um, to catch a rat so and enticed then what is you know you 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 trapped with your own desires drawn away trapped by your desires verse 15 then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin okay so is really talking about thoughts imaginations desires everything being stirred up we being pulled away from doing what we have actually decided not to do or even you know desired the right thing to do we are drawn away by that and we are trapped then he says verse 15 when the desire is conceived it gives birth to sin so he's using that whole analogy of a woman giving birth and and the, and the baby growing uh, in in a woman right uh, in the womb so when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown brings forth death so do not be uh, deceived brethren so we we see that okay everything this whole thing we're talking about till that person actually sins right is everything is in the realm of the mind if you look at it right desires thoughts thoughts desires imaginations um drawn away again by desires trapped along with our desires then you know there is this passage of time or it could be very quickly but then when desire is conceived it gives birth to sin which means that the actual act of sin takes place and then when it is full grown meaning when the sin becomes a lifestyle right it is it is something that's on and on and on and it's full grown it brings forth death okay death in various form you know it can be a, if it's a substance abuse if it's uh, you know it can be a physical death if it's any other thing you know it draws away us from god separation you know from the source of life itself god it's god himself right so he's saying do not be deceived so the thing is this that um, our thoughts are powerful our mind is powerful okay i remember a friend of mine saying okay you know no one can actually tame the mind you know something to that effect and you know, he was saying i think i remember we were in college and he was saying no one you know he was actually you know uh, we were talking about something about giving into temptation or something he said no one can no one can actually control right um and i kind of agreed because i didn't know about all these things right but the fact is this that yes it's powerful and yes james one talks about you know the mind and in a powerful way but in a negative way right it's powerfully negative to do the negative things but the reverse is also true right the same way in which it can be drawn away it can be drawn to the same way it can be trapped it can be actually set the mind can be set to do the right thing the same way you know it it in its full grow it says it brings death yeah well it can be a lifestyle of righteousness which brings life and righteousness and so on okay so it's james 1 if you look at it in a positive way yes that can happen okay but the fact is this you know mind is a battlefield so which means that certain things we need to be aware of certain things we need to do okay so the bible says second corinthians 10 right 3 to 5 uh, is talking about spiritual warfare okay so it says uh, let me just read that right um verses 3 to 5 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh right for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ okay um okay so verse 3 okay do we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh okay so what does that mean 
do we walk in the flesh? Huh? Um, is that what it means? <laughs> um, right? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So here, in, in this context, flesh does not talk about unrenewed mind. Flesh does not, flesh just talks about our humanity, our natural life. Okay, we, we live as human beings, we live in the flesh, natural human life. So he says, um, though we walk in the flesh, you know, this is how we do it, that we live as human beings. We do not war according to the flesh, which means we do not employ natural human methods. Okay, why? Because first of all, that war is not, uh, it's not a natural war, it's not a physical war, it is a spiritual war, right? Because, um, you know, where does he say, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? Yeah. So we know that, okay, it is not against a human being. That is why I walk in the flesh, but I do not war according to the flesh, right? And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What does carnal mean? Um, Romans 8 talks about that, right? Correct. Yeah. So Rom Romans 8 um, talks about, we, we're going to look at that. You know, Romans 8 and verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnal mind is enmity against God. Right? It is not. Yeah. So it means that it is a fleshly. So when we say here carnal and fleshly, we're not, you know, we, what we're saying is that it's, it's given to, you know, human uh, fleshly appetites. It's given to, uh, you know, things that are um, not of God, not righteous, right? So we're saying, okay, um, the weapons are not carnal, but these are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So he's, he's making that distinction. What are, what, is the, what are the weapons, um, these weapons, which means that these weapons are spiritual weapons, and what are they used for? For pulling down? strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, So every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. Okay, What does that mean? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Yeah, bringing every thought, it's like a, it's like bringing every thought as a prisoner. Captive is a prisoner. Yeah, so bringing everything as, uh, it, it's it's mainly like uh, when, 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 when somebody is a captive, you cannot do anything else, right? So you're bringing thoughts, imprisoning the thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Okay, that's what he's saying. Okay, but if you look at it, what are these weapons used for? Pulling down? Strongholds. A stronghold is a, and it's another word, you know, which describes a fortress or a fort. You know? um, what is a fort? In olden days, the people, uh, uh, you know, Jericho was a walled city. We read about that. It's a, it's a, a highly safe, uh, very protective. Uh, I mean, very strong thing, structure. Right, built of stones and etc. You know, uh, and the kings usually the rulers would be there and inside the fort. Okay, so so he's saying the weapons of uh, warfare, which are not carnal, a mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Okay, and where are these strongholds? Where are these forts? 
Yeah, because he's saying, you know, if he's talking about strongholds, he's talking about arguments. You know, what are arguments? Yeah, I mean, like normally, if you say argue, it's something that you. Uh, it's a strong, it's a strong case. Not necessarily. You can argue for something, right? It's a strong set of reasoning. It's a statement, and um, um, no, not not wrong. Not our own understanding. When you say an argument, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a it's a statement or a set of statements that you present for or against something. In a simple way, that is what it is. So, so in our own minds, there could be arguments. You could be arguing, right? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Right? Should I wear this? Should I not wear that? Now, which is the best? You know, the, the lot of argument. What should I eat today? What should I cook today? You know, there could be, you know, th these are simple things. But there could be arguments against the knowledge of Christ, right? Against the word of God. This will be arguments saying, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's actually okay. It's okay to do this. It's fine. It's okay, you know. Uh, it's okay. If just this once, yeah. God forgives anyway. I'm in the grace of God anyway. I I deserve it anyway. I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled, right, to relax once in a while, and uh, you know, I'm okay. Hey, they do it. You know, in the Western Church, they, <laughs> you know, they drink uh, beer. <laughs> you know, so anyway, it came with the, it came with the lunch. I didn't order it, but they brought it. Right, it can be arguments, reasonings in our minds. So, stronghold, we know it's a fort. It's like a strong structure in our mind. It is set. It is set about about a particular matter. It is just set. And and here Paul is talking about a stronghold, which is not of God. Okay, it's. Something that is of the flesh, something that is energized by the enemy, maybe, you know, some imagination, some thought, something which is a stronghold, okay, resulting in maybe behavior, maybe the way we think about certain things, right? Um, which is not of God, right? Pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, again, a set of statements which are for something, a very strong case, right? We build a strong case um, against the truth. Right? And every high thing that exal exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, because that's where the, the actual problem is. Right? Thoughts, reasonings, arguments, imaginations, strongholds, right? all these. So he's saying that, uh, so the thing is to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Because that's the problem. When the thought is not captive, when the thought is not brought captive to the, or it's not subject to God, then there is a problem. Because thought can easily go get into a reasoning, it can get into an imagination, and it can be that desires which James talks about. Because it's it's not a subjected, you know, it's not subject to the word, it's not subject to Christ. It is just going wild. Right? So he's saying, you know, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And here he's talking about, you know, spiritual warfare and the battlefield being the mind itself. Right? Every high thing that exalts itself. Where is the knowledge of Christ? You know, I have it in my mind. I know that this is what God wants, or this is these are the standards of God. But something is exalting itself. You know, this is where. It is, the truth is, but something is trying to lift itself up above the truth of who, what God wants, etc. That needs to be brought down, right? And he says, you know, bringing every thought uh, captive. So strongholds to be pulled down, arguments, reasonings to be cast down, uh, bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, you know, we need to be mindful of ideas, thoughts, reasonings, our imaginations, um, we need to be mindful because it can take us captive. 
it can bring us to a place of captivity okay so is it easy or difficult what do you think why is it difficult if it's easy why is it easy okay everybody said difficult so why is it difficult Mm. So is that the method? <laughs> so that's the thing, you know, once I tried, I tried, okay, I need to take every thought captive. So I'm just, you know, constantly thinking, oh, is that, is that, you know, is that something righteous? Is that unrighteous? And by the end of the day, I was so tired, so tired, right? And and that's not the way to. I don't think that's the way God wants us. Uh, uh, God, like I take it. Uh, so I was constantly thinking, okay, I need to take this thought captive. Uh, uh, it's not something that needs obedience. Mm. It's not something you just say once and it goes, you have to constantly. Mm. After that, I was like, how many times I say this? Yeah, so a couple of things, right? One is our, our understanding that our thoughts cannot be controlled. So maybe that's that's what we think. You no, know, we're saying, okay, our thoughts seem to have a mind of their own. <laughs> it just seems just like a never-ending flow. I cannot control it. I cannot manage it. You know, that's something that we think. Second thing is that, okay, it's too tiresome. I cannot, you know, how many thoughts, you know, like people say that, um, uh, you know, I think somebody, I don't know how they measured it, how they actually probably they did it in a lab and uh, in a controlled setting, but um, you know, they when they measured it, they said there's there's some thirty thousand, forty forty thousand, sixty thousand. Okay, <laughs> thoughts that actually go through our minds. Is, what time frame is it? Like um, 20, for one day, like a, you know, and one day, of course, um, we're talking about you know when you, even when we are at rest, there are thoughts going through, right? So, so you can just think of you know, on an average, this is what it is. Right. So, yeah, you can, you, you might think, okay, it's too tiresome, it's not possible. Okay, but then, when scripture says, you're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, which means it's a possibility. Okay, that's first thing that we need to kind of come to a conclusion in our minds. If, if the word of God declares that we can take every thought captive, that means that it is possible okay and it is a key or it is crucial first step to bringing down strongholds it is a key to cast down arguments reasonings right it is a key to not to be drawn by our desires and to be enticed so so that's the whole that's the thing you know so we that is the first step Okay, we have a question. A question? I don't know. Um, Jack. And so when we try to avoid an argument because we choose to obey God, others at times think we are silent because of pride. In that case, we have to explain ourselves politely um, because we, when we try to explain, there's a possibility of taking defense and we get into another argument. Okay, so we, we actually, uh, Jack, and when we say arguments, we are casting down arguments. Uh, we are talking about our own selves, right? arguments in our own minds where we have reasoning for and against something. Okay, uh, So you are talking about uh, argument with another person, trying to avoid that argument. Okay, So yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, real scenario uh, when we avoid uh, um, uh, an argument. And so maybe my, my, uh, my, my suggestion could be, you know, yeah, maybe in the, at that moment, because of emotions being stirred up, etc. Maybe you can choose a time when it's appropriate to explain. Okay, maybe that person with, with whom you're trying to, you know, you you're, you're, of course you're trying to avoid the argument and you want to, but then you need to explain. Uh, maybe at that point when you're silent, I mean, it, it's good to be silent. 
um, because the person is not in a, any frame of mind to receive that. Whatever you say, you know, um, then the person is not able to receive it, not in the frame of mind to receive. So it will be best to, um, to pause and say, okay, I'll defer it to another time. Uh, I'll put it uh, another time, explain, uh, choose that time, and then I will explain, right? When the person is in a better frame of mind. Yeah, so that is what I would suggest. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, so what is the solution, right? To bring every thought captive. What is the solution? So the Bible talks about, um, you know, different kinds of minds, um, you know, which which are actually, you know, the, what what we saw just now, you know, a natural mind, a carnal mind, a spiritual mind. Okay. Um, so let's look at that. Romans chapter eight. Um, okay, so Romans chapter eight. Yeah, uh, verse five onwards, actually. Okay, so it talks about um, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, So, um, so it talks about a state of mind which is carnal, a state of mind which is not subject to the law of God, because it's focus is on the things of the flesh all the time okay now a carnal mind could be uh, an unbeliever who has this kind of frame of mind or it, or you know the sad thing or the worst part is it can be a believer right it can be a believer who's having a carnal mind right so the person is saying okay you know i'm i'm a believer but then my mind i'm setting on the things of the flesh and it's it's the pattern of the world. It is not subject to the law of God, which means, you know, it's a very frustrating thing for the believer, right? Here's a person who, who loves the Lord. Here's a person who wants to follow the Lord, who wants to do the things uh, as, as laid out by the Lord. But the mind is not subject because the mind is set on carnal things. Okay, and so it it, it says it's uh, you know to be carnally minded is death, which means that eventually, because of the thing is to be carnally minded, it is so filled of thoughts, it's so filled with imaginations, reasonings, right, strongholds maybe, and it results eventually in death, right? It leads the path it leads to because whatever you think in your mind is what you actually live out. What you decide or what you think is what you live. Right? Yes or no? Yeah. Because, you know, our mind is so set in such a way that, um, you know, um, sometimes you think consciously and you act, but you sometimes you think and you act reflexively. Right? It's so fast. Right? So suppose I, I throw something at you, you catch it, but you didn't even think about it. Right? Or somebody throws something and your mind, you know, your your eyes blink because of that dust, you don't want the dust to go in. It just you didn't even think about it, but your eyes closed momentarily because the your your brain sent that signal. It was just a split second, right? And it happened. So it's it's such an important function. So um so all these things are happening to be carnally set means it results in such kind of behavior, such kind of action. Okay, So a carnal mind results in death for this reason. It will result in a lifestyle of carnality. And uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, which is, you know, there's so much of division and strife and so on. So he's saying, for you are still carnal. So is he talking to believers or unbelievers? Believers, the Corinthian church, he's talking to people who are filled with the Spirit. Right? He was talking to people 
to whom he said you come short in no gift right and you come short in no utterance knowledge or anything yeah that's what he says right first uh, first chapter right that you are enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge verse 7 you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our lord jesus you know that's the state of the believer but look at the state of the mind of such a believer saying you're a you're carnal i could not speak to you as to spiritual people because there is envy there is strife there is division and you're behaving like mere men which means that you're just behaving like anyone else in the world so so that's the danger you know we can be spirit filled believers who come short in no gift very gifted right but our behavior can be carnal because our mind is carnal in our mind there is there are these you know there are these strongholds there are these arguments there are these imaginations which are not being dealt with right okay so let's look at romans 12 Okay, Romans chapter twelve, verses one and two. So Romans chapter twelve uh, is an important um, scripture, important key that Paul gives the believers for transformation, okay, for change, change in behavior. Okay, so for change in behavior, he's not saying, okay, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this. For change in behavior, he's saying you need to be renewed in your mind. Okay, that's what we see, right? Um, Romans twelve and verse one, he says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service." Verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so. several things we see here first of all he says you present your bodies as a living sacrifice right just give your whole body your whole self to god holy acceptable acceptable to god which is your reasonable service verse 1 verse 2 do not be conformed what does conform mean do not be conformed c o n f o r m e d conformed what does that mean molded don't align sorry don't copy or don't follow right it just means don't follow and the picture that is of you know uh, fitting into a mold like suppose you have uh, i'm sure you know all of us have played with clay at some point in life right you have you you take one dabba and you put you know clay and then you put it out and it takes retains that shape right and whatever shape of the vessel is it retains that shape you know because it's clay it's wet moldable so on so so paul is saying don't conform yourself don't be like that see the world has a mold the world has a, a certain values certain standards now you don't put yourself and conform to that be molded like that right so don't follow don't set yourself so don't conform to this world but instead what does he say be transformed so again there is a you know if you see what is common in in the english language you see that formed is there that word that phrase formed is part of both those words conformed transformed conformed transformed right be transformed what does transformation mean change okay so what kind of a change is it yeah but what yeah that's what we want but then uh, it can be used negatively also you know like satan transforms himself like a angel of light right so it can be a negative thing also but transform what, what does that mean it means it means a drastic change like you use the word change but it's a, it's a very drastic change and the greek word used there is metamorpho okay that word yeah metamorpho which means uh, uh, from where we get the word metamorphosis right a caterpillar changing into a butterfly going through those different stages and the first stage and the last stage are unrecognizable 
right? Cat we are saying we are wondering, oh, wow, is this what it is that will become this beautiful butterfly? Yes. So he's saying that can be the change. Uh, that can be the drastic change that can happen. How? By the renewing of your mind. Okay. So when you say mind, we are talking about thoughts. We are talking about imaginations, right? We are talking about reasonings and everything. Um, we are talking about you know what is there in our mind goes on in our mind. So we be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. Um, to renew is to make new, is to renovate, change. Okay. Renew, make new again, change again. Right. Okay. Look at uh, Isaiah fifty-five, verses seven and seven to eleven. Okay. Isaiah fifty-five. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Okay, Ways, thoughts. Behavior, thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. What is the words, Lord saying? Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. So he's talking about the unrighteous man who needs to forsake unrighteous person who needs to forsake his or her thoughts and the Lord is saying my thoughts are not your thoughts okay so which means his, his thoughts are thoughts of righteousness the unrighteous man's thoughts are maybe carnal unrighteous thoughts and he's saying nor are my ways your ways says the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts okay so we get we, we understand something here. God's thoughts and man's or the unrighteous man's thoughts are totally opposite. God's thoughts are different. The unrighteous man's thoughts are very different. And the Lord says, you know, you need to forsake that. Okay. So we need to forsake those thoughts. Forsake means what? What does forsake mean? God will never forsake me, but I'm called to forsake those thoughts. Leave, abandon, right? Completely just leave and abandon and go. So the Lord is, you know, the instruction is that that the unrighteous man has to forsake his thoughts. Okay. So again, the question, is it possible to forsake my thoughts? It's a very practical thing. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Okay, forsake is to abandon. So abandon a way of thinking, abandon that analysis, abandon that imagination. That's forsaking. Right? So is it possible? The answer is yes, it is possible. Yeah. And um, you know, so but many times we think it is not possible. My mind is so much stronger, we feel, you know, our mind is so strong, it cannot, but it is possible to forsake our unrighteous thoughts okay and that's the key to a renewed mind and a renewed mind is the key to a transformed life or a transformed behavior right okay we'll stop here and then we'll come back again <laughs>